Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We are very excited to be bringing you an interesting program, The Doctor's Corner. And for our very first guest uh, with The Doctor's Corner, we have Dr. Hotoka Heso, who will be uh, talking about HIV AIDS and the importance of the importance and the awareness of uh, the prevention of HIV and AIDS. Dr. Hotoka Heso is the Senior Medical Officer, ART Plus Center, District Hospital, Dimapur. So, um, hello, doctor. Hi. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming to our studio to give your I- valuable inputs to our, listen- to our listeners. And so, oh, yeah, the rest of our conversation, we look forward to hearing from you. Yeah, so over to you now. Thank you for this time. Thanks to Hills FM, 90.8. Yeah, right. I'm excited to be here. And I believe this is a best platform where there are so many things that we can learn from each other. And I'm privileged to share with you an awareness on the prevention of HIV AIDS today. When we say HIV AIDS, Many people, they think about the fear that's related with HIV. But I want to give you a solution today, the tools to be able to deal with this. Mm. HIV AIDS, when it comes to HIV AIDS, ignorance is not a bliss. We have to be aware. Knowledge is going to be our tool. When you say awareness, it is awareness by definition means it's a concern or well-informed interest about a particular situation or a particular fact. So it's not enough to know something about HIV, but we have to be fully informed about this particular issue. So today, the topic is going to be about prevention. How do we prevent this transmission of HIV? from one person to another or from the infected person to the non-infected part uh, person particularly among the youths so as i said again the knowledge is going to be our tool and knowledge about hiv is going to help you towards prevention of hiv aids So I want to give you four very important roots of HIV transmission. You have to know about these four roots of HIV transmission. HIV bimar, itu puka, ami han shukubra na dikhyado, itu ekjun bra ekjun ke lagi jado. There are only four roots. So we have to know these four roots. If you know about these four roots, then I believe it will help you reduce the risk of transmission. So what is number one most common or most important number one route of transmission? It is by sexual route. Sexual route with sexual sex, unprotected sex with a positive person. That is the most important route of transmission the second is injecting drug use or sharing the infected needles or syringes. That is second. The needle stick injuries, for example, in hospital setups can also come under that. So injecting drug use. The third is by blood transfusion. Transfusion of blood, of the infected blood. And the fourth, and also equally very important, is from the infected mother to the child. During pregnancy, during delivery, 
of the child and during breastfeeding. So I summarize again the four roots of transmission. It is by having unprotected sex exposure. Second is by sharing the infected needles. The third is by blood transfusion of the infected blood. And fourth, from the infected mother to the child. So, when it comes to prevention, if you know about these four roots of transmission, there's a guarantee that you will be able to prevent this transmission of HIV from one person to another. So, most importantly, HIV is transmitted through sex. So there's a simple formula for that when it comes to prevention. Number one is called, that formula is as simple as ABC. ABC. A stands for abstinence. Abstinence means to, ab to not get involved in sex, especially for young people who are unmarried, to abstain is definitely the best and only option for pre from prevention of this HIV. The second most is, uh, another second most important is being faithful. B stands for being faithful. Whether you're married or whether you are unmarried, you need to be faithful. Faithful to your partner, and that will definitely reduce the risk of transmission. And C, if you cannot follow or A, A or Bs, the C can be another very important tool for prevention for you. C means condom. Correct and consistent use of condom is going to help you towards prevention of this HIV virus transmission. So, um, sir, talking about uh, um, abstinence, yeah, the, the three ABCs, but um, one thing I would like to ask you is also, you know, I think many people are not aware that uh, the sexual partner is uh, suffering or has uh, HIV. So I think the ignorance of not knowing that our partner is infected with HIV also leads to uh, to the transmission of the disease. Yeah. So um, is there any way, or would you like to say anything about um, uh, about how we how are we to know, you know, that our partner is uh, is an infected person? Okay. <laughs> uh, very very interesting question. <laughs> HIV itself is called STI, sexually transmitted infection. Right, right. Okay. Yes. Being the most common road is a, uh, through sex. Right. So, but interestingly, HIV does not have any signs or symptoms of STI, unlike other STI like syphilis, gonorrhea. Okay. Okay. So we can actually, it's very difficult to say your partner could yes. be suffering from right. HIV. And HIV being a very chronic disease, right. it, many people may be suffering from HIV, but they will remain quite healthy for mm. a long time, mm. even up to 10 years or even above, in, in spite of having HIV infection. Right. So it is very difficult to, uh, to know that a partner or somebody is having HIV. Right. So the only uh, way to identify is to be aware that you know you have to uh, have such knowledge so that you take that necessary precaution or care. And um, before being diagnosed with uh, HIV, you know. Um, is an infected person also likely to know that he or she is suffering from HIV? Like, I think some, I mean, for most people, until they go to the doctor and get yeah, it yeah. checked, you know, they are not aware that they are, yes. they, they do have the disease with them. Yeah. So, yeah. right? Yes, because yes. you see it up to 10 years, a person can remain healthy, yeah, yeah. then only the signs start showing. That's or right, yeah. That's right. 
So that's another very good point. Uh, there are a group of people, we call mm. them high-risk groups. Okay. Okay. <laughs> high, high risk. High HRG, high-risk groups. Okay, okay. So those who fall under this kind of category, mm. it is a big responsibility that they should go ahead or come up for right. testing. Right, right. So who are the high-risk groups? One is uh, female sex workers. Mm-hmm. Yes, there are programs to reach out to them and they, they do their regular uh, testings. But there are so many who are not you know, coming forward right. to identify themselves as female sex workers. MSM, men who have sex with men, MSM, you must have heard of it. So these people are also coming under these high-risk groups. IDUs, injection drug users. Right, right. These are high risk groups. Migrants or truckers. Right. We categorize them also under high risk groups. So these are the high risk groups and these are the people who should be doing this their test regularly. Unfortunately, Nagalin, there's not much registered or recorded high risk groups. Okay. But it is already in the community. Right. HIV positivity or HIV infection is already in the community and it's in the general population. So to answer your question, I would say that anybody who had a history of high risk behavior in their past, whether it's injection drug use, whether it's unprotected s- sexual intercourse, in the past, it can be even from few months to even few years, even up to 10 years, because the symptom may not be showing today. So if there was any risk, then he or she should come up for the testing. Because unless you do the test, it is difficult or impossible to uh, diagnose that you are having HIV. And timely detection, timely detection and timely treatment can save your life from HIV infection. HIV is preventable and HIV is manageable. So um, my last question with this point is, um, will... Um, is there a high risk of transmission even in a one-time sex with a with an infected person? Yes, I would tell you. <laughs> See, there's a risk of transmission. Right. We have these different categories. Uh, there are many stories when they come to us when they are positive, and some people they're shocked that they got infection. They are not knowing how they got it. Also, right. some people, but. As I said, there are only four routes of transmission. It's not, you know, it doesn't just happen like that. Right, right, yeah. So, the, when it talk, talk about the risk of transmission, it could be a one-time unprotected sexual intercourse or unprotected uh, injuries, needle stick injuries. So, the risk can be, when you say the r- category of risk, by blood transfusion. Suppose you got a HIV positive blood transfused in your body which usually we advise after screening screening for HIV and some other infectious diseases so HIV transmission risk of different routes by blood transfusion is about 90 to 95 percent risk is very high it's the highest risk when you are in transfused with HIV positive blood then perinatal the mother in HIV positive mother to the unborn child, to the child. Perinatal is 20 to 40 percent. That's also actually very high. And now most important is sexual exposure. We call it 0.1 percent to 10 percent. 0.1 percent to 10 percent. And needle stick exposure is 0.3 percent. So if we see these categories, yes, even by one exposure with an infected partner, can cause but there are people who are married for several months or years and still surprisingly or shockingly some are still negative so sometimes it also depends on the amount of virus that the infected partner could be carrying or some certain practices that they are uh, practicing so unexposed unprotected sex can put somebody at risk even with one exposure so uh, talking about the infected mother to the child 
uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure there are ways now, you know, to avoid the the transmission of the disease to the um, unborn child, right? But once the child is born, the child is living with the same environment as the parents, as the infected parents are. So, um, how high is the risk of the child getting the disease um, after he or she is born? See, first of all, as we talked about it, the chances of the transmission from the mother to the child is 20 to 40 percent without treatment from the mother. Right. So there's a good news that if the mother is detected very early during pregnancy or even before she conceived and she's already on ART treatment, which is the treatment for HIV positivity. So then the virus is becomes becomes undetectable in her blood. So the transmission is almost negligible from the mother to the child. So the mother the child can be born without HIV first of all. And that is the benefit of the treatment. So we see many children these days who are born without HIV. But for that the mother has to be on treatment, early on treatment and regularly on treatment. And once the baby is born, we give a prophylaxis syrup for the baby, just in case there is some transmission during delivery, not when the baby was uh, uh, inside before delivery, but during delivery. If there was any exposure for that, there is some syrup, nevirapine syrup for the baby for a few, for 45 days to 90 days. And when it comes to breastfeeding, if the mother is on AR, ART treatment with vi good viral suppression, then the child can be breastfed. The risk is hardly negligible because there are benefits for breastfeeding. But if the mother, if the child is HIV negative when it is born, then the risk of transmission sp is very, very less. And breastfeeding is one option which we have to deal with. We have to discuss which is the right option, whether formula feeding or breastfeeding. So um, after the uh, precautions of breastfeeding and all these are taken care of, you know, that is, in, uh, uh, that is under the medical duty, you know, uh, how about living in the same environment with the uh, parents? You know, as babies, they are very, um, what do I say, immune to the diseases, even cough or fever, right? So living in the same environment with the parents, you know, just the infected parents raising the baby. Um, yeah. Is there any risk in that? Okay, I will bring you to that uh, to the topic. The potentially infectious body fluids. What are the things that carry HIV in the blood? And if we know that, again, if we know that, we sh and if we take care of that, we can prevent that okay. while taking okay. care of the sick patient or the those who are uninfected. Right. So there are certain body fluids which are hi at high risk when we get exposed to that. And f number one is blood. Exposure to body fluids considered at high risk is exposure to blood. Blood of a positive per person. The next is semen. Next is vaginal secretions. Next is CSF, cerebrospinal fluid. Next is pericardial effusion, peritoneal uh, effusion, amniotic fluids. These are the medical terms. So these are the fluids in the body which carry HIV virus. So if you are exposed to such body fluids, whether it's about a child or about other person living in the same home or in the same setup right. like a hospital. So these are the high risk body fluids when we get exposed. And for your or for the information, exposure to body fluid considered not at risk. Even if you get exposed, but those fluids are not at risk. We put them as tears. Okay, the tears does not carry HIV virus. The sweat, the saliva, or the urine, or feces, the sputum, or the vomitus.
Oh, okay. So these are the things that we come across. I thought saliva it, was saliva by itself <laughs> was dangerous. Yeah, saliva <laughs> by itself does not carry HIV virus. Okay, by research. So also sweat, sputum, tears. But there's one thing: any body fluid contaminated with visible blood. All right. Any mm-hmm. body fluid contaminated with visible blood shall be considered at risk. Oh. Saliva with bleeding, some gum bleeding is there in the saliva. Yeah, yeah. Then the blood has already contaminated that saliva. Mm-hmm. Say ulcer, mouth ulcer, some people... Like a wound, a body wound? Body wound has most probably blood. Yeah, yeah. 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 So anything contaminated. Say, say when it comes to kissing then if there is a blood contaminated then or uh, through ulcers through blood through gum bleeding then the risk is there it cannot be not at risk mm. yeah so when you talk about all this coming back to your question like uh, young people right. young people are mostly at risk when you say high risk group again it's actually the young people who are at this group when it's about general population, mm-hmm. still again the young people are at high risk. So, the age group which are mostly affected today, when you see the Nagaland scenario, is between 15 to 45 years. 15 to 45 years almost uh, covers around more than 60 percent of HIV positivity. So it is actually very high, and it is mostly saturated among the young people. And we we need to know why young people are getting affected so one is the lack of awareness as a young people they are not having that awareness they don't have that health seeking behavior they are not they're lacking in self sex practices even when it comes to using condom or other self sex practices they are getting young people are getting involved with drugs and alcohol so these are one of few reasons peer pressure or experimentation when it comes to young people again it's one of the reasons why young people are uh, falling into this situation drugs have you heard of sunflower there's a new yeah, drug yeah. in the m- new trend yeah, in town <laughs> yes these are very addictive drugs even gay sexuality people are taking it as their choice not knowing what they're going into. So these are the practices which are putting more risk of getting HIV from others. Young people are becoming very materialistic, I would say. Just the use of smartphone, for example, or the selfies, just for example. What is it talking about? It's talking about yourself. So when you are so materialistic, Definitely, you put yourself in a situation where, you know, you put it yourself at risk. For the want of everything, you sell your body. So, so whether it's girls, especially girls or boys, we need to be very careful. We need to be careful with our body so that we don't get infected with this HIV. So, coming back to the prevention, because today the topic is prevention. You know, there's a term we use, treatment as prevention. What is treatment as prevention means? Those who are infected with HIV and they are on treatment, then they are virologically suppressed. Okay. They don't carry any more virus in their blood. And we can do that. We can identify that with blood tests. It's called HIV viral load tests. When we do tests for those patients who are already on ART for more than six months, their virus becomes undetectable in their blood. And so we call it uh, UN AIDS has a slogan. We call it uh, U equal to U. Untrans. Un. Detectable viral load equal to untransmittable. That means a person who is on treatment, virally suppressed, will not transmit to another person. 
So if all the HIV positive people come forward, do their tests and put on treatment, then it can be a very important tool for prevention to spread this infection from others to others. So that's very important that everybody who have a risk, who may not be knowing today that they are having HIV, but if they have a risk, possible risk, then they should come ahead, do the treatment, don't take it negatively, come ahead so that you know your status and you're on treatment, then you can prevent your transmission to others. There is another treatment for prevention of HIV and that is called PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis. And there's another thing called PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. So these two terms, PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis and PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. Post-exposure prophylaxis is a drug which is given, which is, a, which is given to those who are exposed, when they get exposed to HIV. Within 72 hours, this medicine has to be given. And it is given for four weeks. One, one tablet in a day for 28, 28 days. So if anybody gets exposed to HIV through unprotected sex or through infected needles, through blood transfusion, within 72 hours if this medicine is used, and ideally or preferably within few hours of exposure, then, then we can, we are able to prevent this transmission. Yes, that's called post-exposure prophylaxis. So if somebody gets pricked, which happens quite often in a hospital setup, every now and then some from different hospitals, they, or even in my own hospital, they call and say they got pricked, what to do? They panic. Huh? So the most important is don't panic. There are things we can evaluate. Sometimes we don't know who's, you know, the source of the source of the infection also. Like we may not know that the source is HIV positive or negative also sometimes. Or even when it comes to sex, it can be with a positive uh, person or it can be HIV negative person also. So we have to evaluate all that and we can give that. And there are some other tests we can do to see whether that person is HIV positive or not. Because this is just for prevention. So there are certain steps to follow, but there are treatment which is available towards prevention for those who are exposed accidentally. Hmm. And when it comes to PrEP, it's called pre-exposure prophylaxis. Mm -hmm. It's not for HIV positive people, it's for those who are negative and who are at high risk. Those who are practicing high risk behaviors, they're having a HIV positive partners it can be their sexual partner, it can be their drug use partners, so or gay sex. If they have a partner who is HIV positive and they are still in that relationship, in that situation, then there is a uh, drugs, it's called PrEP, it can be used and it is, it can help towards reducing the risk of HIV transmission from one partner yeah. to another. So uh, talking about this, um, is it uh, mandatory for a person with an infected person to be on this drug for their for mm -hmm. a lifetime? For PrEP, it is given not necessarily a lifetime, okay. lifetime. But as long as the exposure is high at risk, then it will go on. It will continue. It can continue daily ahead. Yeah. You know, as long as the risk is involved. All right. Like for instance, you know, somebody is um, somebody got married to a per, uh, to an infected partner, yes, right? Yes. Yes. So uh, the chances are obviously very high. Yeah. For for the other partner to yes, get yes. infected also, right? Yeah. So uh, my question is: Does that uninfected person uh, is it mandatory for him or her to be on this drug for a lifetime, or is it like a one-time treatment? No, from before we even prescribe, mm -hmm. we have to first evaluate and see the uh, oh, okay, the okay. negative right. partner is truly negative, and if then only we will prescribe, and it will be prescribed and it will be given for as long as the exposure is there, and if 
they can practice safe sex practices then they can uh, stop that and if they want to add on to the safe sexual practices still it can be continued when it comes to especially married couples one is positive the other is negative we can give that and they can continue to use that and once the partner conceive for example in a in that family and he or she does not want to continue then they can uh, hold or stop that and they can use other method especially the best is use of condom yeah so these are the different ways where we can help in prevention of hiv transmission so number one is awareness you and i should be aware well informed and we have to make a choice information or knowledge itself is not enough i would say it's not enough to know it you have to have an informed choice you have to decide so there are consequences it's all about your choice so be informed because the only way today is to prevent this is to by adopting healthy behavior and practices that reduce the high risk of hiv that's the only way knowledge itself is not enough and prevention prevention is the only cure so i appeal through this platform that be well informed and make the right dis- choices if there is any risk in your life in your past please come ahead do the test because your status will help you to live a healthy life if you are negative that's great and you continue to live a very uh, healthy life if you are p- positive then also there is hope there is hope that with treatment you can live a healthy life and with your treatment you can prevent this transmission from one person to another so i will end with this Yeah, thank you so much, Doctor. Yeah, that was a, l- a lot of information and yeah, awareness in such a short time. We look forward to having you again f- to talk about you know more of the other segments of uh, HIV and AIDS. Dear listeners, I believe that you have all benefited from Doctor Hotoka's sharing today. As they say, it's easier to stop something from happening in the first place than to repair the damage after it has happened. Let us all stay aware, spread awareness, and stay safe. Signing out for today, this is your host, Belivi. This is 90.8 Hills FM radio station, using our voice to rake your choice. Stay tuned. <laughs>